Well, when we have uh, some dicey weather on Saturday nights, I start thinking about Sunday morning and what attendance is going to look like at church, wondering how that's going to affect things. And so I start thinking, what if uh, only 10 people show up? Am I going to preach the sermon that I had intended to preach? Or am I going to pull something out of the vault and something that may be somewhat near to what we're talking about in the series and save the message for another week when more people are here? Because I think my, part of my thinking is the series that we are in is important because I want people to be able to catch the uh, transition from week to week, the connections that we have so that you know, they don't necessarily miss out. Um, so I started thinking about that. And I have decided, drum roll please, no, I have, uh, I, I, I'm really impressed with how many people we have here today in spite of the weather. Uh, and Kent was telling me just a little bit earlier, he says, you know, the roads really aren't that bad, you know, and, uh, but I've decided I'm going to go ahead, and we're going to go ahead in week two of the series uh, at Refuel. Uh, and uh, I would encourage you that if there's some people, and there are some people that I think are probably not here because of weather, and, and uh, uh, that's, that's okay. But they have the opportunity, and you have the opportunity, encourage them to go to our website, and you can watch, you not watch, but you can listen to the sermon there, and that way you kind of can feel connected, uh, not miss, um, because this is a short series, uh, and in short series, if you miss a week, it can really kind of throw you off and think, well, how did we get to here from, from there? But today we're going to continue in our series called Refueled, and if you would, go ahead and take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Now, up on the screen, you see a picture of three glasses. And now I have a simple question for you concerning these three glasses. Which glass is full? Glass A, glass B, glass C. Let me, let me talk about each one of them for just a second. Glass A has no liquid in it. Glass B has some liquid in it. Glass C has more liquid in it than B. Which glass is full? At first glance, you might say C, right? It's full. It may not be filled to the brim, but it's what we would say is a full glass. In fact, if you were at a restaurant and glass A is sitting in front of you, the server might walk by and you might say, hey, would you fill this up? If you're at that same restaurant and you have glass B in front of you, the server might just come by and top it off for you. So the answer is C, right? I mean, that's a logical choice. But actually, the correct answer is all three. All three glasses are full. Oh, glass A may not have any liquid in it, but it's still full. What's it full of? Air. Glass B may be half full of water or liquid, and the other half would be air. And glass C is full of liquid. And now, now, some people might say, well, David, that's a trick question. Which glass is full? Well, I suppose you could view it as a trick question, but the reality is, when I ask the question, which glass is full, you automatically thought in a manner that you have been trained to think. You've been trained to think that in order for a glass to be full, we must be able to see what's in the glass. However, even though you cannot see the air in glass A, 
it is in fact not empty at all. Is it? Now, last week, I had you, I had you perform a little exercise. I had you turn to your neighbor and say something, and I still think you had a little bit too much fun with it. I asked you to turn to your neighbor and say, you're a loser. <laughs> well, this week I have something else I want you to tell your neighbor. You ready for it? This is what I want you to say to your neighbor. You're full of it. Go ahead. Should be easy for some of you. You're full of it. Okay. Now, and I see even, I even see some finger pointing going on across the room. It's not that's not I guess according to the good Samaritan that is your neighbor. But you're full of it. Now, you've heard this phrase before, I know. You've probably used it. It's a phrase that usually refers to someone who lies or exaggerates. I mean, you would say it to someone, you would say, you're full of it, when they say something to you that you find hard to believe. Or that you know whatever they said is out and out false. But I'm here to tell you this morning looking at all of you, you are full of it. (laughs) I'm full of it. But what is it? It is the Spirit. We are all full of the Spirit. If you believe in Jesus and you follow Him obediently, His Spirit is in you. You are full of it. You are full of Him. You're full of God. And it doesn't matter how small or how big you are, he fills you up. I mean, from, and she's not in here right now because she went back to junior worship, from Olivia Bazanga, who turns 11 this month, is that right? 10, Lord, turns 10 this month, okay? From Olivia Bazanga, turns 10 this month, baptized her three weeks ago, to people like Helen Thurston and Jane Everts and Richard Zink, who were all three baptized on the same day, on June 22nd, 1941. From three weeks old as a Christian to 71 and a half years old. From the youngest to the oldest in Christ. We're all full of the Holy Spirit. All that said now, let's go to Romans chapter 8. Listen to what Paul says, starting in verse 1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving Spirit, the Holy Spirit, has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Now let's skip a few verses. Go to verse 5. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Now if you skip down to verse 11. The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you and just as god raised christ jesus from the dead he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you how excellent is that that jesus that that paul tells us that those who are in christ as we've said in the way we would define that is those who believe in jesus they follow him obediently are filled with his spirit the same spirit that brought Jesus back to life is in you and in me. (laughs) How wonderful is that? We're going to talk more about the Spirit. I mean, that's what this series is really about. 
the Holy Spirit in our lives. How He fuels us to live for God. We're going to talk more about Him and what He can do for us. But first, let's pray. Father in Heaven, thank You for Your Spirit who even just right now has been speaking to us through Your Word. Thank You for His presence. Thank You for the gift that You have given to us of His presence. That we might live in a way that pleases You. That we might be able to learn from Him and grow in Him and be who You've designed us to be. And Father, during our time here this morning, I pray that Your Spirit would just speak to our hearts and that we would be drawn closer and closer to Him, that we might live every moment of every day aware of His presence and aware of the impact that we can make for Your kingdom because of Him. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, I, I want to be full. And I have a feeling that you want to be full too. And without trying to belabor the point or beat the dead horse, we are full. As followers of Jesus, His Spirit fills us. Yet, how come many Christian people feel empty and settle for emptiness when His Spirit is filling us. The church in Ephesus evidently was settling for that empty feeling. I mean, they were living in the first century. They were living during a time when persecution was real. Not to mention... It had been a few years since Jesus had ascended to heaven and people were starting to talk, well, when's he going to come? Is he going to come at all? And so it would be easy for them to start giving in to questions and start feeling a little empty inside. And then we go to the book of Revelation and Jesus speaks to the church at Ephesus and he says, I have this charge against you. You have forgotten your first love. You remember what that was like back when you were really young and maybe in junior high or high school and you had that love, that person that you really thought you loved. And then those feelings that you had kind of of went away a little bit. You felt a little bit empty inside because of it. Jesus says, you've forgotten your first love. So I have a feeling we can probably identify a little bit with the Ephesus. They settled a little bit. They've allowed that emptiness to come in and to reside. And the question is, is why do we allow that to happen to us? Why do we allow the emptiness to come in and to take hold? It doesn't make much sense, does it? Because empty, living empty when you're actually full is kind of like saying I'm hungry and your refrigerator and your freezer and your pantry are overflowing with food. (laughs) There's no reason for it. There's no reason for the Christian to feel empty because he's full. And Paul's desire for the church at Ephesus, and I believe his desire even for us today, even though he didn't know us when he wrote it, (laughs) We find in verse thirteen of chapter, or verse nineteen of chapter three. We used it last week. It's kind of the centerpiece of the series, where he says he wants us to know this love. Talk about the love of God, this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul says, we have this love, he wants us to understand it, so we can know that we're full. So if we're full, then why does emptiness seem to be so prevalent in Christ's followers? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to be negative. (laughs) I mean, 
Last, I, I, and that's the, that's the last thing I really want. I want this to be a blessing for, for us. To help us see what is in our lives, not what is missing from our lives. So I'm not saying that we're walking around depressed and empty, but however, if we're not careful, and many times we aren't, circumstances arise in which we allow ourselves to be controlled by those elements other than the Holy Spirit. And we give in. And we don't live by the Spirit of God. That Spirit that God put in us to strengthen us, to comfort us, to guide us. So if the Holy Spirit is in us, then why do we allow ourselves to feel empty? Well, I think it all goes back to the three glasses. Which glass is full? Your answer is determined by your perspective. And your perspective is determined by how you've been trained to think or how you have trained yourself to think. So if you concentrate on the emptiness, then guess what? (laughs) You're going to feel empty. But if you concentrate on the fullness of God in your life, then guess what? You're going to feel full in spite of the circumstances that are trying to drain you. So see, it's easier than you think. And that's the title of the message. Last week, it's, it was, it's not what you think. <laughs> this week, it's easier than you think. See, you don't get full of the Holy Spirit just by reading the Bible or praying or spending a, time alone with God. You get full of His Spirit by, this is simple, asking for it. In Luke chapter 11, verse 13, Jesus says, If you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? When we come into a relationship with God through Jesus, we are essentially asking Him to give us the Spirit to live in it, to live in us to help us, to guide us, to teach us how to live in light of eternity. And every day we have the opportunity to ask God to keep us full. And as a result of this fullness, we read the Bible more, right? The Spirit will lead us to do that. We'll we'll pray more, right? Because the Spirit will guide us to do that. We'll want to be with God's people more. The Spirit will compel us to do that. We'll show more compassion. We'll serve where there are needs. We'll give love that reflects the love of God. That's what we will do because we're full and we ask God to come into our lives and we ask God to come into our life. His Spirit comes into our life and He fills us. So, because of His presence in our lives, there's some adjusting in the thinking that we have to do. Because I think sometimes we have allowed our thinking to be skewed because we've been trained to think certain ways. We've been trained to think, I'm empty. I need to be full. When in fact, we're already full. In this series... Last week I told you, each week we're gonna, I'm going to tell you there's something that we need to stop doing, and then there's something we need to start doing. Today, the thing we need to stop doing is this. Stop thinking so big. Now, I realize that may sound weird. After all, we are f- trained to think big. We like big, don't we? We dream big. We supersize our meals like big screen TVs. We like big, grand gestures, kind of like showing your love by a marriage proposal at the Royals game. (laughs) It's big, it's grand. We like that. 
when it comes to the Spirit of God in our life, the big is great. Not going to ignore the big. Not going to say, no, I don't want big. However, we don't want to overlook the small things. You know, if you read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what we find through the Gospels are lots and lots of brief encounters that people have with Jesus. And those brief, those small encounters have big effects. For example, in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus says to this guy, do you want to be healed? (laughs) And he said, yes. Jesus says, be healed. Sent the man on his way. Brief encounter. Big change. Matthew chapter 9, Jesus says, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. And a paralyzed man got up and walked away. Brief encounter. Big change. Matthew chapter 9, again, a woman touches Jesus. People are just crowding in around him all over the place, and he says, who touched me? She comes forward and identifies herself, and Jesus uses nine words. Daughter, be encouraged. Your faith has made you well. Boom. Brief encounter, big change. Luke chapter 6, just the phrase. Everyone just wanted to touch him. Everyone just wanted to have a brief encounter with Jesus. Luke chapter 18, the blind beggar, Bartimaeus, and Jericho, crying out, trying to get Jesus' attention. The disciples are saying, be quiet, be quiet. He doesn't have time for you. Jesus stops. Restores his sight. Brief encounter. Big change. Luke chapter 19. Zacchaeus. Enough said. Brief encounter, big change. They were big deals, yeah. But they didn't take a lengthy amount of time. See, what I want to impress upon you is this. The big is good. The big is what we want. The the change in our life is big. But oftentimes... The big comes out of the small. And here's what I want you to see. This is what I want to impress upon you. Practice the presence of God one small bit after another. It's kind of like taking on a big project. I mean, it doesn't matter what the project is. It's just a big project. And a big project can be overwhelming, can't it? So oftentimes... You break that project down into smaller projects. Tackle one project at a time. And the same can be done with our relationship with God. The same can be done with with the presence of God in our lives. Instead of saying, I'm going to practice the presence of God the rest of my life. (laughs) That's that's a long time, (laughs) I hope. Why not say, my goal is to do that but I'm going to have to break it down in smaller sections. I'm going to practice the presence of God as I begin this new day. I'm going to practice the presence of God as I drive to work this morning. I'm going to practice the presence of God, dot, dot, dot. You fill in the blank. For whatever comes into your schedule And whatever fits your life. And next thing you know, the day is done. And you've had one brief encounter after another with God. And you spent the day with Him. And you're still filled with His Spirit. So stop thinking so big. Stop thinking about this big grand thing that you have to do. But start thinking about, okay, I'm going to handle now. I'm going to take care of the present. 
and I'm going to practice his presence. I'm going to live aware of his spirit living in my life. I'm going to, however you want to say it, I'm going to stop thinking so big, and I'm going to start enjoying the small connections I have with God. Now, here's the thing, though. This is kind of a side note now. What does all of this do with the purpose of us coming together today like this? We, we got into this a little bit in Sunday school, but haven't we kind of been trained to think that we come to church on Sunday to get refueled for the week, to get revived Because Monday through Saturday, the world just drains it out of us. And boy, we need some spiritual renewal and revival on Sunday. Isn't that kind of how we've been trained to think? Well, the truth is, you don't need to come here to be filled for the week. You're already filled. You're not any less filled on Saturday night, filled with the Holy Spirit on Saturday night than you are Sunday when you uh, leave the church building after a service. So you don't need to come in here to be filled. You need to come here because this gives glory to God. You need to come in here because it's a means of connecting with others who, like you, are filled with the Spirit. You need to come here to remember as the church together the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. I mean, there are all kinds of reasons to be here today, but to be refueled is not one of them because you are already fueled by the presence of His Spirit in your life. So we've got to stop thinking so big and think brief encounters. And this morning is an encounter that we have together with God. And we can enjoy this small connection that we have right now. I mean, it's just one moment at a time. And you'll find that you have the fuel that you need. See, what we're really trying to accomplish is the practice of keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. He wants to lead us down a path that honors and pleases God. So we need to honor, we need to follow him in order to do that. It's really what Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. It's really the end of the thought. And there's a big context here, but simply, here's the point of it. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Just recently, we watched a a TV show on National Geographic called America's Greatest Animals. Ultimately, what they were doing were comparing animals from from North America to Africa and South America. You know, how would the animals that we have compare to those animals and, you know, how rugged are they, how, you know, I I can't remember all the the ways that they, they tried to compare them, Um, but to put it all down to the end, they gave us the top five of animals in North America that were the hardiest, that were the strongest, that could, you know, survive the best and all that kind of stuff, And, and to cut through the suspense, the polar bear was number one. But if I remember right, number five was the wolf. The wolf. One of the cool things about the wolf is this. They have the ability in the snow to follow another wolf by running in the paw prints of the wolf in front of them without fail. To step perfectly into the the paw print of the wolf in front of them that's running, no less. And by doing this, they can travel farther, they can travel faster, they can track their prey. God gave them this innate, natural ability to do that. 
And that's what we're talking about this morning. The wolf has the ability to keep in step. (laughs) And God says the Holy Spirit is leading you as a believer. And you need to step where he stepped. He's guiding you down the path. We need to take advantage of that. And of course, it all comes from keeping our eyes on where he's leading us. If we do that, and we can take advantage of the small moments, we will see big results. See, it's easier than you think. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your presence here. Thank you for the ability that you give us through him to live a life that honors you, to, to, to not give in to the obstacles, the temptations, as long as we can take this moment in time and focus on what the Spirit wants. That we keep in step with Him. And by doing that, we keep in step with you. So Father, during this time, right now, I pray that your Spirit would just continue to speak to us. That we would know what you want from us. And that we would follow In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, Jesus himself tells us that small is big. (laughs) In Matthew chapter 17, he says this, Even if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, nothing will be impossible. Think about that. You have faith as small as a mustard seed. One of the smallest seeds there are. If I just have enough faith that would be that small. He says that's big. That's huge. So what do you need to do today to break the pattern of emptiness? To be refueled with the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Well, you may think that what I'm going to ask you to do is big, huge. But it's just a simple act of faith. Because Jesus says, if a faith as small as a mustard seed can move a mountain, (laughs) well, then even the amount of faith I'm talking about today can do wonders. What I want to suggest to you today is that you need to make a connection with Jesus. And maybe it's by making him Lord of your life if you've never done that. Just takes a little bit of faith to step out from where you are, to come to the front, to surrender your life to him. But I also know that I'm standing in a room filled with people who have already done that. And sometimes this becomes bigger for us than it was for us to first make that commitment of faith. That if I have just enough faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and he can, through his Spirit, do wonderful things in my life, and I've not been keeping in step with the Spirit, then what I need to do today is to step out in faith. Come to the front and surrender my life to him again.